this morning's message is is going to be one I think I I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't challenge you in some way, but I hope it's also very encouraging. To help set the stage, though, you're going to need to watch something, another video, and it's very different than the first one you just saw. Um, I want you to watch this. There's, there's people in wheelchairs in this one. There's people doing backflips. But imagine which of these things, if you could do any of them, which would you want to be? Which, if you could really pull this off. So that's for you right now. So they're very talented people. Um, so when I was in high school, my whole dream in life was to be a great basketball player. And things didn't always go the way that you have planned, right? I ended up being about 5'9", couldn't jump, couldn't shoot, and rather slow. So that sort of holds that against you. That's actually a picture of me in middle school, 8th grade, and I got a little taller than that, but... Look at that guy I'm trying to box out. That just, is that even fair? You know, and at some point you realize maybe, maybe you're not cut out for something. So I have all these ideas of what I, I could be or should be. Uh, the video that you just watched, some of those things were really cool. I, I, lock, I, lock, I watched those things, I think of especially like, uh, the snowboarding. I, I used to really want to be a good snowboarder. I thought, how hard can it be? Just go down the hill do a turn. And so that was important to me at one point in time. Uh, another thing that I would like to be is a really good soccer coach. Wouldn't that be really awesome? What if I was such a great soccer coach that Mosney won a state championship? Did you know that not a single team north of Highway 10 has ever won a state championship in soccer? What, what if, except for a, there's a private school in Green Bay that has won a couple. Um, what if we did that? Imagine the platform that Jesus would have through me if we had this. I could go out and speak everywhere at soccer symposiums or something and tell people about Jesus at, as I tell them how to coach soccer. Okay, so that might be, okay, those are all things maybe. Um, how about more spiritual? What if I was a great dad? What if I was such an amazing dad that my boys just did exactly what they were supposed to do all the time? Wouldn't that be so cool? Or how about this? What if I was an amazing pastor? What if I had the ability to be this great pastor so that every single, every single student in Mosinee and Marathon and D.C. Everest it all came to know Jesus? Wouldn't that be so cool? That would be awesome. And so I have in all these mind, all these things, if I had this ability and this power, what I might do. But God in His wisdom doesn't always give us the kind of ability and a power power that we would like. Have you ever wanted this? What about, what if we had the power to make money? What if we were really good? What if people of good news are really good at making money? Wouldn't God further his kingdom with that? How many of you have ever wished you could make a little more money? I, let's be honest, that's probably all of us, right? All right, maybe that. Or what about this? What if we had real political power? What if we had that? What if we could put in office the right people they would do the right things for the right reasons and not for the lobbyists, for us. And they would make right policy choices and do the right things. Wouldn't life just be perfect then? God didn't promise that either. He didn't promise any of those things. Uh, what, would we, what would we wish for? Maybe relationships that would really work. Maybe a marriage that would be amazing, that just does what it needs to, to be. How about this, power to be disciplined, to, to move more and eat less. Wouldn't that be great? But God gives us the power to be extraordinary. And today's message is a little bit about salt. If you read the, in the program, the very first page, it talks about all these things that salt can do. Salt is extraordinary. It, it can melt ice. What would we do without salt in Wisconsin? It, we'd all be in the ditch right now. Um, we couldn't go anywhere. And we put in our food, and it does all the preservative things. It's, it's amazing what it can do. So that's all, that's all powerful. But it's also very ordinary, isn't it? Probably every single one of us in this room has a container of salt of some sort in your house somewhere. At every restaurant, it's on every table. It's everywhere. So salt is very ordinary, and yet it's extraordinary in what it can do. 
Today's message and what we're going to be talking about today is about the extraordinary that God puts in each one of us in the ordinary, the ordinary us that is out there. And those things combined, understanding who God is and what He's about and understanding who we are makes all the difference in the world in changing this world. And He gives us the power to be something different. I'd like to do something right now to maybe make this message a little more real, a little more relevant to what your life is. I'd like you to shut your eyes right now. Shut your eyes just for a moment. And I want you to think of right now of a person. I want to think, have you think of a person in, you know in your life that you know doesn't know Jesus yet. Or maybe, maybe they know Jesus but just not on the, in, in the way or in, to the level that they should. I want you to think of them right now. What would happen if God impacted their life? Open your eyes again. What I'd like you to do is, if you have a pen, I'd like you to write down that person in the, in the circle of the program that's for this morning's notes. Because today's message and everything we talk about kind of revolves around what God might be doing in that person, what God might be doing in you, and through you. So go ahead and write that down right now and follow along this morning because it, it is what he is about this morning. He is about transforming truth in your life. Acts 1.8 is where we're going to be starting from. We're going to end up in Colossians in a little bit, but Acts 1.8 is where we're going to start. And if you have a Bible, I would in, invite you to turn to that just now. Acts 1.8, it's, it's the passage that's very famous for what Faith Promise for Missions is about, about sending people around the world, but it has everything to do with what we're doing right here, right now. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I want you to notice that little word, but, right there at the beginning. Jesus is referring his disciples to an answer he's giving. He's referring back to the question that they've asked, and he's giving them an, just what they need to know. Let's find out what the question was. If you turn back just a little bit earlier, a couple of verses earlier, in Acts 1, verse 6, the disciples asked this question. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're asking him. And the picture of the throne right there is a reminder of perhaps what they're asking. God, Jesus... You just rose from the dead. You appeared to us. You have this amazing speaking ability. You can raise from the dead. Perfect. Okay. When do you want to start the kingdom? And we'll do it right here in Jerusalem. We'll start it right here. Um, we already know kind of who's going to be the best officers for your kingdom, for the army and all that kind of stuff. The Romans are giving us a lot of trouble. When do you want to start it? We'll, we'll start today. Let's, let's get going. When is this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had in their minds this picture of King David in the past, ruling with authority and doing just the things that they want. And Jesus' answer starts with a but. Now students, Dr. Pope reminded this last Wednesday, didn't he? Uh, it, Dr. Pope came and spoke to our group on Wednesday and he said, so if you're talking to your parents and all these things are happening and then they say, but, what does that mean? But, you know it's coming. You're going to have to clean your room, or you're going to have to shovel the driveway, or you're going to have to do something, do the dishes, who knows what. But, this is coming. It's not going to be what they're wanting to hear. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Jesus is offering power. He's offering power this power and he's it's going to be different than what they expect so god gives a salty promise an extraordinary promise and i guess what i'd like you to do right now to help this come together is write power on that very top line if you're very good at spelling you could write extraordinary i would probably spell it wrong so i would just stick with power it's a lot easier so power acts 1.8 tells us that we'll receive this power and this power is connected to the word ability. That's, that's what the meaning of the word. It's not authority. It's, it's more of ability. It's, 
it's like when you put on something and it just sticks to you, it just moves with you, it goes with you. It's like your favorite t-shirt or a, a really good hat or whatever, that favorite pair of pants, you know, it's, it just, it, go, it moves with you wherever you go and you can't get rid of it. God gives us this power. Now there's a debate in the church about what the Holy Spirit power might mean. In some churches, the power of the Holy Spirit means this amazing sign gift, maybe uh, speaking in tongues or doing a miracle of some sort. In other churches, this power of the Holy Spirit is to save you, and it happens when you become a Christian the first time, or maybe even at birth with a baptism, and then that's the truth, and it sticks with you the rest of your life. Very, maybe unemotional. And so the church doesn't always know how to handle this verse. I would say it's a little... It's a little bit of beyond maybe what any one church has. The, the Holy Spirit is designed to come into a person's life and it's supposed to be difference making. And maybe there's an emotion that is tied to that. Maybe this has happened to you in worship. You get goosebumps or tingling down your spine and you realize, man, that's not normal. That's not where I was just a few minutes ago. That's a reminder that God is real. And that's a good thing. But maybe also it's truth. Maybe this relationship with God is not just based on emotion. It's based on this truth. It's written right here and so I can believe it. Think about who God is. He's amazing. He's powerful. Is God an emotion? I, he, he's way more than that. Could he use emotion to accomplish his purpose? Absolutely. He's all these things. And he's giving this power, this ability to his people through the Holy Spirit. And if I could describe it to you today, I don't know if I could, but I just know he offers it to us. And the extraordinary is not you, it's him in you. And so everything today, if you hear something that sounds impossible or crazy or not, not even, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not you. That's not what this is about, about what your amazing things can, can be. He also tells us in Acts 1.8 that you will be my witnesses. He says, he says in, in 1.8, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What is a witness? A witness is a person that has observed what God has done, what God has done through us. Every single person here probably has a slightly different perspective and it's probably all true about who God is. God is has worked in our lives and we know we are different because of what he has done. So God is in each of us in a unique way and we are witnesses to that fact. And God's amazing power in us is teaching us and showing us and making us more aware of what he's, he's done. To different levels and different degrees, we have all heard from God and he's speaking out to us. And then he, he promises this extraordinary power to be his witnesses everywhere. He's telling us that we can share this amazing truth and this world will be transformed locally, further out, and literally around the world. He will work through his people no matter where it is around the world, whether that's in China with like where my sister is, in Panama with the, Her Panama with the Hirschbergers, locally. He will give us the power to do that and he'll do that through us. The people that are in this room right now. Now at this point I need to probably pause and stop because some of you might be getting nervous. Some of you might be thinking, Pastor Joe, if you're talking about me going to my neighbor this afternoon, knocking on their door, sharing the four true sport, four spiritual laws or something, that's a bad idea. You don't know my neighbor, you don't know what's going to happen there. It's, I, it might be like strapping someone to a, to a wheelchair and sending them over a ramp. I don't know if you saw that in the video, that's a bad idea. Don't ever do that. There's, um, there's a wheelchair here at Good News that we offer for people. Don't ever try that with that wheelchair. It's not, it doesn't work the same way. If today, if you hear me say, you need to leave here and do that, and you will, it's, it's, more, it's more than that. It's maybe, I don't know, I, I don't really want to say it's more complicated but it takes more than you just deciding one day to get up and go and do something. 
God needs to work through you to accomplish his purpose. And you need to hear the rest of what I'm saying this morning to understand a little bit more what this is about. The rest of Acts, Acts starting with chapter 9, going to the end, is about the story of the Holy Spirit working through his people to accomplish his purpose. And it takes some time, it takes some process. It doesn't happen automatically. But if we put ourselves in the right position, he can do those things. He can do something powerful. You should, you should know this, and you know this intuitively. Did you save yourself? Did, did you, when you decided, I'm, I'm, I decide I'm going to, this Jesus might be legit, I'm going to follow him. So you pray this prayer. Did you save yourself? Absolutely not. You did. God saved you. The Holy Spirit in you through Jesus Christ, by God's plan, saved each one of us. Could you go out then today and save someone? Could you go out there and save somebody? Go them and all of a sudden, what you, you say these words and all of a sudden they're saved? No, you can't save yourself. Why would you think you could save someone else? You can't. It depends on God through his Holy Spirit working through us to accomplish that. Superheroes are not required. Ordinary people are. So, let's talk about what that would require. I want you to write at the very bottom, ordinary. Ordinary. Ordinary is what you can write there at the bottom. We're going to turn for the most part for the rest of this message to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to Colossians because it's going to make a lot more sense if you turn with me there and you can follow along with where I'm going. Some of the verses will be up on the screen, but not all of them. And so I'd like you to be able to read it for yourself. Paul's prayer for us in Colossians 4 reminds us about what God's kingdom is and who it's for. It's for ordinary people. Later on in Colossians chapter 4, after this section, after verse 6, there's the people that Paul was writing his letter to. If you read through there, you can read about some interesting, interesting names. Pastor John calls it, might call this the, the Greek phone book. It's Tychicus and Onesimus and Aristarchus and Mark the cousin of Barnabas. All these people, why, why are they in this Bible? You, have, you might be wondering, Epaphras and and a lady named Nymphia, Nympha, and all these, all these peop, people that he's writing to. Who did God work through to accomplish his purpose in the New Testament? Did he use people like Paul, these church planner, really outspoken, brave types? Yes, he did. But he also used very ordinary people. And in fact, he used people with issues. We know of at least three people at this end of Colossians, we know that Demas, Onesimus, and John Mark, as you read other portions of Scripture, all three of those people had issues. They had a falling out with Paul. They either wandered away from the Scripture. Onesimus was a slave that ran away from his master. There, there's all these things. The, these people had challenges, things that you, would, you and I would say would probably say, they're not qualified. But God seems to pride himself in taking the unqualified to accomplish his amazing mission. All of our weaknesses, quirks, and faults. That's what he uses. So let's turn back, just looking back at that verse, Colossians 4 verse 6. Let's find out what this ordinary person might be like, what they might be doing, what they might be saying. Colossians 4 verse 6 says this, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That word conversation is the word logos. It's a common word in the New Testament. It's used in the first chapter of John to describe who Jesus was. It's the words that you use, what should they be like? Your conversation, your word should be full of grace. He's not telling us exactly what to say. You won't find today a lot that I'm going to tell you. This is what you should say. But the attitude and the way that you say it that's pretty clear. What should it be like? What should it be like? It should be full of grace. Did you ever notice that there's a lot of negativity in this world today? There's a lot of people that don't have a lot of positive things to say. But if we can bring grace, we bring hope into this world and we start helping people realize maybe our situation can be different. Seasoned with salt is the next one. This is the main 
reference that you're going to hear about this salt that we've been talking about this morning. Season with salt means, in this case, to restore the flavor. It, it has this idea that something you say is worth remembering. Has it ever happened that you're listening to someone and they keep talking and talking and talking and saying something more and more and you realize they really don't have much to say this morning? And you wish that they would maybe, maybe wrap it up so we could all move on to what we all want to do next. But some of us just keep on talking, don't we? And how do we let people know? Sometimes maybe I wonder if people aren't listening to us because most of the things that we say really aren't that even important to us. One of the most powerful ways that we can share, start sharing our faith and living it out and presenting it in a way that means something to our world is that we start believing it. That we share it with the authority and with the passion that we believe it has. If it's changed our life, that's the way that we should share it. If we bother to speak and if we bother to talk about the things that mean most to us, it ought to sound different. It should carry some force and some meaning behind it so that people realize this is not just information. I'm not just talking about American Idol. I'm talking about something that'll change your life. And that's worth listening to. The section in Colossians then goes on to describe if we are these ordinary people, if we are just ordinary people that, and if our conversation is starting to go that direction, we're starting to go that way, but we have this extraordinary God, how we can start bringing the extraordinary God into our ordinary lives and making a difference. This salty prayer that Paul offers. Colossians 2 verse 6 is what that is all about. It says in Colossians 4 verse 2 that we should devote ourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. The one key word in this whole paragraph is devote. That's the one main word that you should really be focusing on. As you, as you read everything through here, it should be, that should be coming back to you again and again. Be devoted. Be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to prayer. That should come through a lot. Let me just say this right now and, and press pause as, as we're going forward. And this might be the most important thing that you need to hear this morning. Prayer is the way that God works through his people to accomplish his purpose. And God really, really loves you. And he really loves the people that you're around. In fact, I would say he loves you and the people around you and the people that you wrote, that, that person that's on the line in that circle in the middle of your paper, he loves that person more than you do. And he would love to see that person be transformed and changed into something different, even more than you do. But before you go out and start telling people about God, we should, be, we should be talking to God about people. We should be talking to God about the people that we care about and let Him take ownership of that. Let, let Him know that you're, you're trusting and waiting on Him. In 4 verse 2, we're told to be watchful and thankful. As we're praying, as we're devoted to prayer, we should be watchful and thankful. Our platform is built on the awareness that God is seeing what is going on. And he, he reminds us to look for opportunity. In 4 verse 3 it says, And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. God wants this opportunity, even more than you do, to share your faith with someone. Now I'd like you to write down this word on that spot I guess it'd be to the left. On the left side, write clarity. I'd like you to write that right there on that line. If you're going to pray for something, one thing you could pray for would be clarity. I find it interesting that Paul asked for that. Colossians 4, verse 4 says, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Why in the world would Paul need clarity? Paul was a Hebrew scholar. He grew up in the synagogue. He knew the Old Testament far greater than anyone in this room today. And he knew it backwards and forwards. He probably had the first five books of the Bible memorized. He was also a very good speaker. He could talk and argue with the people of Athens. When logic was required, he could argue with people on that, those grounds. But maybe Paul realized he needed some help with speaking clearly and maybe narrowing down his focus and, and talking more 
There's a story in the book of Acts. I don't know when we're going to get to it, but it's, it's an interesting one. You won't want to miss this one. There's one night that Paul was sharing his message, and he started talking late into the night. And apparently he felt it was so important that he keep on talking that he kept on talking. And he talked further and further. And there was a man, or a young, young man, sitting in a window listening to what Paul was saying. And it says that as Paul went on and on, the young man fell asleep and fell out the window. Now, I don't know, I hope that never happens at Good News Church, where somebody falls asleep and, and because they're falling asleep, they, they die. But Paul had this ability, he could raise him from the dead. So he just went outside, raised him back, you know, from the dead. And then, you know, what a moving illustration. Now listen to what I'm saying, you know. We don't have that ability here, probably. So we're not going to try that. But God works through his people, but sometimes we don't always know what to say. We're not always real clear. We don't always know how to describe it in a way that makes sense to the people that we're talking about. So we need God to work through us. Maybe a way to illustrate this would, for me to describe what my relationship is like with my two boys. I've, Andrew and David, they're, they're great kids. Love them both to death. Love them, just love them great. They're great kids. Andrew loves sports. Anything with a ball, he wants to play it, and he loves to win. If you play Andrew in tic-tac-toe, I discovered yesterday, he's got to win tic-tac-toe. It's not just a game. You have to win or lose. And Andrew is great. He's great to be around. David, if you want to play, that's great, but that's... That's really not his, his deal, all right? And winning, uh, he wants to win, but it's not nearly as important. He's great at music, or he, he loves to sing, he loves his art, and he gives great hugs. I, I, I think I've got a good relationship with both those boys, and I love them dearly. But my relationship with both is different. We're far more complex, and everyone you see around here is far more complex than just, than just the same thing. We can't... I can't write out these, say these three lines to anyone and it'll, this will work. Just try it. You're more complex. Everyone you meet is more complex than that. And God wants a relationship with us, not just this, everybody the same thing. So he is developing this relationship and we should probably communicate God's truth, the gospel, in a way that makes sense to them. Not in the way that makes sense to us, but in, this, in the way that makes sense to them. So we have to study and know the people that we want to share with. We also have to study and know God's word. So at the right time, we can share in the right way, in the way that they need to hear. Why should we pray for clarity? Because it's really hard to communicate the gospel to someone in the way that they understand. The world wants to hear this. I truly believe the world wants to know what these words are. They're desperate for it. They're looking everywhere for something that will give them meaning. They want to hear it for themselves in their own language, in their own way. But it's so hard to understand. And there's so many other messages coming through. How can we, how can we possibly share it? So Paul says, pray for clarity. That's what we need to do. We all should, should do this, and I want you to write in that other line, if you would, fearlessness. And this is one time that we will have to leave briefly to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul writes this in Ephesians six nineteen. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may fearlessly make known the gospel of, the, the, make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should, as I ought. Okay, here's a man that was already in prison. He was already in jail. He was already being persecuted for what he believed, and yet he was fearless, and he was asking for more fearlessness. Have you ever known that it was time to say something, but it was really hard for you to say it? Even with people you love, you're afraid to say, that's happened to me before, where you want to say it, and you don't know if it's the right word, but man, it's, you're going to have to be bold if you're going to say it. At times, that is what is required. We should be fearless people with sharing this most important truth. If Paul needed it, we needed it too. We need it now. To seize that moment when the moment comes, when that moment comes across, where we're at work, you're, you're just talking about regular, everyday, normal things, and then all of a sudden, the situation that they're dealing with at home 
comes up. Or that the situation that their, their, their mom or their dad or, or whatever they're dealing with. Or their relationship with their friends is falling apart. Or their relationship with the children or drugs or whatever. The money, it's whatever. Things happen and people open the door, maybe even slightly, for you to share. And you know from that Holy Spirit talking to you, and you know what I'm talking about, where it might be time to say something. And I, I'm not saying today that every single time the door opens, you're supposed to say something. I don't know about that. I, I'm not in your shoes. I don't know. I would just say that if Paul asks for prayers, for fearlessness, we should maybe pray for the same thing. And maybe good news would be a tremendously different place if we could do that. I'm seeing how this is happening in the lives of our people. Even right now, I've, I've been able to see this happen. On Wednesday night at youth group, I was talking with uh, a person that came to our youth meeting for the very first time this last Wednesday night. And they'd ended up there, and after the whole meeting was over, I went up and talked to them. I said, so, what did you think? What, what, what happened here? What, what, what was it? And, and what he just said was, it, it wasn't what I was expecting. He didn't say a whole lot. I, it's his first time with us, so I didn't want to drill him or anything. I just wanted to let him know that I care and listen to what he had to say. But that young man is a lot like every one of us in that he wants his life to make sense. And the church and the things that we do here, don't they're, they're a little bit scary sometimes, and we're, we're not sure about that. But he needs someone to tell him he needs someone to put it in his own words, in his own language. Someone needs to go up to him and say, hey, why don't you come with us on Wednesday? I think you, you, might, you might get something out of it. Everybody wants this, a life to make sense, a life to make worth living. And Jesus does that for us. A question that you might be asking is, why does God work in this way? Why does he work through people? Why does he choose to work through people to accomplish his purpose? Something happens in our lives when we realize that we are the ones that we can communicate this gospel, this all-powerful message. He's the one. Something changes in us. On Monday of this last week, I was talking to another student in our group, and I was describing what was going on in a friend that they've been bringing to youth group. They, this friend that they've been bringing over time has gotten more and more involved. It, in small group then, the, this, this other Wednesday night, they were really giving a lot of good answers. You could tell they were really engaging. Things were changing in their life. This young, other person that we both are starting, or new to me, a friend of, friend of theirs, was really getting involved and in, in, integrating themselves into what was going on. I was just telling them about this interaction. And she was happy to hear that. She was happy to hear that her friend was changing. And she said, you know, I was hoping that would happen when I brought this person to our church. And that stopped me right in, our, in my tracks. She called this our church. Like it was her church as well. Now, her family doesn't go to good news. And as far as I know, she, I always thought she was kind of maybe not real part of the, you know, real part of things. I don't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't know where she fit in. But she called this church her church. And it, this church is so meaningful and the gospel is so meaningful to her. She had to share this with a friend. What has gone on in this person's life is God and a relationship with him has gotten so important that you can't help but share it with others and it's changing who she is on the inside. What happens when we start sharing our faith with others is the gospel changes from that message that Jesus had, that thing that Paul wrote about, that place that I go on Sundays, to this is where my relationship with God is, this is who I am, this is where I'm going in my life and you need to hear about it. God chooses to work in that way because that's the only way that he can really make a difference. Wouldn't it have been easier for him? He, he could just send some angels down, like every, say, 20 years or so. Send some angels down, they go everywhere, and they do amazing signs, and everybody gets saved, every, like every 20 years. Or maybe, um, maybe we have this amazing power. We can just go up to people and grab them on the head, and, you know, they change it to Jesus people or whatever. That, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. They, it's not like the force, like on Star Wars or something, where you zap them with electricity. It works people to people where we share the truth and, and we realize we're 
we're not clear sometimes and we're, we're scared sometimes and we have faults and we have weaknesses and we don't do it right and we screw it up along the way and then we have personal problems at home and we have baggage and we, everywhere we go we bring all this junk with us and why would anybody want to listen to us? And yet that's how God decides to work in his amazing kingdom. That's what this is all about this morning. So salty living is what we're going to talk about as we finish today. Salty living is, is just this. It's identifying your person that you know you, that God has put on your heart. You wrote down their name perhaps right there at the, at, in the middle of your paper there. And then it means to start praying. Be devoted to prayer. Maybe in the morning when you wake up, you say, you know, God, I'm going to see this person today. Help me, help me have ears to hear. Help me have the conversation that I need to have. Maybe it means every time I, you know, I, I go to lunch, I, I go with this person to lunch, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be praying for them as I go to lunch. Before I pray for my meal, not out loud, not so they can hear you, but God, pray for this. No, no, just pray in your heart, in your head. God, help me be the right person for them. And then at some point, you're going to need to start preparing your thoughts. What does clearly, what does fearlessly mean? Salty sharing might be this. I'm going to make it very simple. You could write this down if you want. You might be able to remember it without writing it down. But I, I, I want you to, to know this might be the way that your friend needs to hear. You could talk about what your life was like before you met Christ. Talk about what were the things going through your mind. Probably you're just like them. And then what brought you to Jesus? What are the things that happened in your life that helped you understand that you needed to be about Jesus? Jesus needed to be in you. And finally, what has your life been like since you met Jesus? It, no, one, no one claims to be perfect and no one needs to be perfect. That's not even the point. It, it's not about us. It's about what God has done. The whole book of Acts... Really, the whole Bible. What good news is about is about making disciples. It's about helping us get from where we are right now to where we need to be. We are being transformed. We are being changed from one thing to something else. We are not arrived yet. We are on a journey. We're getting to where we need to be. And God is bringing us there. And in his wisdom, he decided, you know, the best way to help our people along, at some point, you might need to share what you have with others. And just what would happen in our own hearts if, if that started happening? We're going to listen to a song just now in closing. And as we're listening to it, I want to invite you to close your eyes and pray along with. Pray along all these things. Pray for clarity. Pray for fearlessness. Pray for your friend. And maybe even this week, you'll get an opportunity to share about what it is that, that God's been different in you. The, the song we're listening to is, is instrumental, but it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And it reminds me to, to say, what changes us from the inside out? What makes us different? What makes us free? It's, it's this, this blood of Jesus that he shed for us. He did it all. The cool thing about who Jesus is, is that we don't have to have the answers. We don't have to do the saving. We don't have to do anything. We just have to be us and really care about the people that we're trying to share this with. And authenticity overcomes a lot of barriers. If you really care about the people and you really believe in the message, more than the words you might share, that will overcome much. So I would invite you this week to start being devoted to prayer and seeing what God might do in the life of that person you really care about. Because God cares about them even more than you do. Let's go and live that out this week.